Hello again everybody and uh, the third part of my talks about Hadrian's Wall and this part is about the life of Hadrian's Wall after Hadrian. So it was less than 20 years after Hadrian had died that, that Hadrian's Wall ceased to be the frontier of the, of the Roman Empire in Northern Britain, if ever it had been really uh, the frontier in the conventional sense. The Emperor Antoninus Pius decided to move things forward to occupy uh, Lowlands, what nowadays we call Lowland Scotland and Northumberland, and the new frontier line will be between the Forth and the Clyde, more or less between uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh, and a new great big border wall uh, was built. And this wasn't made of stone, which is why there's much less uh, evidence of it now. This was made of turf and timber, and it was known as the Antonine Wall. Now, after Antoninus Pius, under a succession of emperors, not least Marcus Aurelius, uh, the one, the emperor at the beginning of, uh, who gets snuffed out at the beginning of Gladiator, um, the next 40 or 50 years was a period of very great disturbance and disorder in uh, that part of Britain between uh, at the Antonine Wall and Hadrian's Wall. It's very difficult for us to know what actually went on since there's no coherent literary record of that. And the archaeology is difficult to understand and pretty patchy. So the next time that we really hear of Hadrian's Wall is uh, at the end of the reign of Septimius Severus, the emperor who died in York in 211 AD. Now he was a great campaigning emperor. He obviously decided he was going to campaign in Northern Britain. He was going to sort things out and establish a proper frontier. It was at the end of his reign that a substantial amount of building work, uh, rebuilding work, started on Hadrian's Wall. So much so, in fact, that uh, uh, Hadrian's Wall was actually known as Septimius Severus's Wall for well over a thousand years. Anyway, uh, after he died in York in 211, his two sons, Caracalla and Geta, who were supposed to uh, rule jointly after him, um, they both left Britain fairly sharpish and went back to the continent. Caracalla then uh, seemed not very much interested in Britain, uh, but quite interested in killing other people, including uh, his own brother Geta. So he was the sole emperor, not uh, a joint emperor. What happened on Hadrian's Wall for the next hundred years or so was uh, a process of consolidation and pacification and integration. One very interesting little detail comes from uh, this period, and that is, so it's a result of uh, restrictions on the Roman army members uh, being allowed to marry. Uh, it was at the end of the second, early third century that Septimius Severus allowed Roman soldiers legally to marry, because up until that point any marriages had been unofficial. We have a tombstone, or rather we have two tombstones, one of which comes from South Shields and the other comes from Corbridge and this is from, from a married couple. He was in the army. She was a former slave called Regina from Essex. He interestingly was called Barates and he came from Palmyra right in the far east of the empire in what is uh, well uh, Palmyra now. Uh, been much in the news in recent times uh, with quite a lot of it blown up by uh, so-called uh, Islamic State. But Barates and Regina were married and their tombstones mention each other and they show about uh, quite a lot about life in Northern Britain in and around uh, Hadrian's Wall. So South Shields and Corbridge, just south of the wall uh, with Barates and Regina, quite interesting. So what happened after that? Well, there's uh, quite a bit more um, rebuilding around uh, 300 or so. There seems to have been a sustained attack by the Picti, who were lowland Scots, uh, the painted ones, uh, and uh, quite a lot of rebuilding and refortification happened on Hadrian's Wall around that time. And then follows a period of gradual integration and pacification as much uh, as it had been in the third century. By 409, 410, uh, effectively Roman rule in Britain was at an end because the Emperor Honorius said he was no longer able to send reinforcements to defend Britain against the invasions of the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes from Northern uh, Europe. Britain was on its own. What happened to Hadrian's Wall then? Well, it gradually started to be dismantled by people who wanted to build farmhouses and churches. One interesting little uh, detail is 
if you go to Hexham Abbey and uh, you know where to look in the crypt, there are signs to it, if you go there, uh, part of an inscription from Hadrian's Wall put up uh, by Caracalla and Geta uh, has been used in the foundations of Hexham Abbey. But the interesting little detail is that the name of Geta has been chiselled out, more or less, because after Caracalla had murdered Geta, uh, Geta suffered what was called damnatio memoriae. He, you were going to be airbrushed out of history. So an interesting little detail there uh, about the, the, the second life of Hadrian's Wall. We don't hear much about Hadrian's Wall until about 1600, when the headmaster of Westminster School, one Mr W Camden, or probably Reverend W Camden, uh, wrote about it in his book Britannia, and about 100 years later, Reverend John Horsley also wrote about it in a big survey uh, of the Romans in Britain. But the really significant thing happened around the late, well, the late part of the 19th century, when the Newcastle uh, uh, town clerk, one John Clayton decided he was going to sort uh, Hadrian's Wall out because it had all fallen into ruin. So he set about rebuilding it and restoring it. Now in some ways this was a great thing because quite a lot of it you can still see and the bit you can still see in the central part of the wall is largely John Clayton's restoration. But uh, in other ways it was a really bad thing because he did it in a very un-Roman way. He built it more or less as a dry stone wall without mortar and so that has had a number of consequences. So, for modern archaeologists, I don't know whether to laugh or cry uh, at, the, at the work of John Clayton. Anyway, it is what it is. The modern uh, version of Hadrian's Wall uh, is looked after now by various groups, including English Heritage, and it's a World Heritage Site. So, well worth going to visit, and you can walk along uh, the length of it. I'd recommend going west to east, and then at the end of the afternoon you've got the sun behind you, not in your eyes, but it's a great thing to do. So, future talk is going to be about life on the wall, uh, and particularly about some letters, very unusual letters, which have survived to the present day.